Welcome to the Student Ministry Podcast. My name is Steve Cullum, and I'm your host. And uh, today we have Justin Herman on the podcast, and we're going to talk all about his recent transition, all about his Controlled Chaos podcast, and also his book. It's going to be an excellent conversation. I'm really excited for you to hear it. But before we jump into that, we need to thank our sponsors, our amazing sponsors that are here every episode to just continue pouring into uh, this podcast and, and allowing you to to hear it every month. So let's first thank WorkCamp NE. That's W-O-R-K-C-A-M-P-N-E dot com. We want to thank them for their sponsorship. And uh, if you have not checked out their website, make sure you do because they're a great organization that just helps you make some amazing experiences for your students. If you're looking for a uh, an awesome opportunity to go out and serve people and really make a difference and in the United States, then make sure you check out their website. And also if you're looking for maybe um, your own trip, you want a customized kind of trip, make sure you check them out as well because they also do that sort of thing. So if you haven't checked them out, do so right away. We also want to thank the combined sponsorship of the National Network of Youth Ministries at youthworkers.net and Reach Youth New England at reachyouthne.com. Both of these organizations are all about connecting youth workers together. Maybe you've been trying to do youth ministry on your own and you're out there, you know, trying to trying to make it and, and some of you are probably succeeding and some of you are probably, you know, struggling. It's okay. Um, we're in this together and both of these organizations are all about connecting us together so we can lean upon each other, encourage one another, and, and just maybe even create some partnerships between your churches and the other youth workers in your area. So make sure you check out youthworkers.net and reachyouthne.com and uh, connect with other youth workers in your area. We are so grateful for both WorkCamp NE, the National Network of Youth Ministries, and Reach Youth New England for sponsoring this episode of the Student Ministry Podcast. We do want to also recommend that you subscribe to this podcast and share it out there with others. So if you're new to the Student Ministry Podcast, you can subscribe to this on pretty much every podcast app that's out there. But uh, maybe you you have been around for a while and you haven't shared it with someone or you haven't left a, a positive comment for us. Make sure you do that. And we are so be so grateful uh, for you to do that for us. All right. Well, with that out of the way now, um, it is time to talk to Justin Herman. Well, hey, Justin, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. This is a great podcast. I'm, I'm really, I'm blessed and thankful to be a part of it. Awesome. Well, you have a great podcast yourself and we'll, uh, we'll talk about that in just a bit, but sure. for those of you who have not heard of Justin Herman, uh, fill us in a little bit. What's, what's God done in your life to bring you to the point where you are today? You know, gosh, there's just so much the, that you can say, and I guess I'll start here. Um, so I'm 33 now. 33 very long years of life and very glorious years of life. Uh, I'll start at the beginning here and say I was adopted. I was adopted. uh, I was five months old when I was adopted. My mom was a prostitute in New York City. Um, She got pregnant and didn't want to have an abortion and gave me up for adoption essentially right away. And I was put into adoption agency. Uh, They were amazing. My name was Perry at the time. Um, and, uh, And I was adopted to a great family in Buffalo, New York, where I grew up. They were married for a number of years, um, ended up getting divorced when I was seven. My dad left, just marriage wasn't for him anymore. And when, uh, and when that happened, my mom, who was a stay at home mom, uh, became a single mom who had to go back to college. And she did, you know, a lot of me, you know, the nature, nurture, like, you know, there's just so many great conversations you, you can have around that topic. I mean, I know this for sure that during a very pivotal time in my life, I saw a mom who did not roll over, did not give up, did not quit. Um, and that had made a huge impression on me, sure. not just, not just as her son, but just as now as a man, like, you know, as a leader, you know, the, I enjoy the, the difficult path. Like I enjoy the path of maximum resistance. Um, I remember standing in welfare lines with her for food stamps. I remember standing in heap lines with her so that, you know, the government could help pay our heating bill that year. Um, I remember all those things in downtown Buffalo. Like I remember waiting for hours for her to talk with caseworkers that, you know, to them, we were just a number. Like I mm. remember her humility and asking for scholarships for her son to go to camp. And like, I just remember all of that. And it shaped so much the leader, so much of the husband that I am today. Um, 
she sacrificed a lot um, so that I could live in a in a great area in in Western New York, go to a great high school. Um, she sacrificed a lot um, to make sure that I took school seriously and could make a different life for myself. And I did. I mean, I, I graduated high school. I went to college in Missouri and studied, uh, you know, youth ministry. Um, I was the first college graduate in my family, which is a gigantic deal for anyone who's out there who is the first college graduate mm-hmm. in their family or has, they have a relative who is, maybe their father was or their grandfather was. I mean, you, you, that's a big deal uh, in our culture, at least, to say you were the first in that kind of a milestone. Yeah. And I was the first one to graduate. I graduated. I started school late. Um, I graduated at 25. Um, so, and I started my career at 25, turning 26 in California, doing youth ministry. I was working at a church uh, called Christ Pacific Church. Now it used to be a Presbyterian church and it still is a Presbyterian church, but it was part of PCUSA. And during the whole, um, you know, collapse of PCUSA, Mm -hmm. uh, they joined the echo denomination. And I worked there for like a year and a half and and it was an incredible time. And I still have friends from those years and it was great. Um, and I moved to a church called Mariner's church in Southern California. It's a um, one of the largest churches in the country, a multi-site church. And, uh, and I did junior high there. I was the junior high pastor there for six years. And now I work at a church um, called Sandals Church, which is another massive church, one of the biggest churches in the country, one of the fastest growing churches in the country. Um, and I, I oversee junior high through high school um, across all uh, nine campuses and more will be added. And, uh, and it's an incredible time. And, uh, you know, a piece, you know, to just for reference, just to kind of get a better mindset of me, you know, here's the thing, you know, money is cool, but I'm not attracted to money. Mm -hmm. Um, I having influence, you know, being, being able to be influential in in a space is so much more valuable to me. Um, I learned that at a young age, I have an incredible wife. Um, her name is Brittany. She's a psychologist uh, at a school district um, by Riverside. I have two kids, um, Beckett and Cannon. Um, Beckett has autism. He's incredible, an incredible memory. Like, I can't wait till he's old enough to play poker. <laughs> and, you know, Cannon's just a typical kid who's just, you know, absolutely wreaking havoc and doesn't listen to mom and dad. And we were living in Irvine, and the and she would drive an hour plus to work every day. And it was just really tough on the family. My mom passed away. She had cancer. Mm. And she passed away in December of, of 17. And when she passed away, um, you know, the cancer went to her brain. It was, you know, a, a lot of it was pretty sudden. When she passed away, it's like something just, there's a piece of me that just, you know, clicked differently mm. that I immediately wanted different things for my life. I immediately started asking different questions for my life. Questions like, what do I want for my kids one day? You know, what do I want my family legacy to be? You know, w- you know, what do I want my kids to remember me for the way I remember my mom? And one of the things that just kept hitting me in the face was I want my kids to look back. And most importantly, I want them to be a follower and a lover of Jesus Christ. I want that. I want them to love the church, not hate the church because dad works there and has always put that first. Mm -hmm. Um, I want them to have a deep, intimate relationship with their grandparents, not a casual one. Um, The majority of society sees their parents or their in-laws once or twice a year, if that, usually around holidays. That's why it's the biggest travel time of the year because everyone lives so far away from each other. And and I had asked myself, you know, even though my in-laws lived an hour away, so from where I lived in Irvine to Riverside in, in California, it's about an hour away. But because of the 91, which is, you know, the, you know, everyone has traffic where they live probably. Most places do at least. The 91 is just a gridlock of traffic. And so because of that, it turns, you know, a one-hour drive into sometimes a three, four-hour drive. It's absolutely the worst. And so we only saw them once a week. Now, a lot of people would say, man, once a week, that's really good. Um I grew up with my grandparents. I saw them like three, four times a week. Like mm-hmm. we were close. Um, Brittany, my wife, grew up with her grandparents really close. But at Brit, we wanted to different things for our lives. So we made the really tough decision to leave Mariners and put family first and walk away from a ministry that was thriving. It was one of the biggest middle school ministries in the country. Um, a great staff, a generous budget. Um, at a very influential church that's influencing other churches that host Catalyst West. They host the CIY Believe Tour. They host the Orange Tour. So all those thinkers, all those leaders, they're all coming through. And 
and you know, that's something really to be stoked about. And it's a job that I'm, I'll be honest with you. And I'm not the one who said this. Hmm. Josh Griffin said this to me because he, he left Saddleback. Mm-hmm. Um, and when he left Saddleback, a lot of people said to him, like, are you crazy? Look, you're leaving one of the best. And he used that as a, as a, as a springboard of encouragement for me that, you know, Hey man, you know, there's a lot of people in this country who would die to have the job you're leaving but you're leaving because there's more important things than the job. I think a lot of youth workers don't get that. And some of them do, a lot of them don't. And, and it, me and my wife made the decision what was best for our family, but it, it was a really unpopular thing. It was a really difficult thing when I left. Um, but I left and, and I don't regret it and I would make the same decision again. And I would hope I'm doing this in a way that, you know, 15 years from now, my kids, like, I don't know if they're going to get it. You know, I don't know when they'll get it, but there's going to be a day that they get it that, that their relationship with their grandparents was more important than their dad working at a mega church with a waterfall, you know, and a lake on it. You know, there's just, there's going to be a day. It's not going to be today or tomorrow or 10 years from now, but when they're in their like mid twenties or something like they're going to look back at an ocean of memories and they're going to, they're going to be told the reason you have those memories is because your dad and your mom valued you one day having those memories over building some kind of a ministry empire or whatever, yeah. you know, or the accolades that come with, or the you know, affirmation that comes with working at a large church, which, you know, I've worked at a large church. I've worked at a small church. Like, you know, it's just whatever. Um, you know, I want my kids to have that and they'll know that one day. And that's more valuable to me than, than absolutely anything. That's awesome. That's so awesome. And, and great. To, so great to hear your heart behind, you know, this. And it's, you know, I, I hope that other youth pastors out there are, you know, doing things for the right reasons and everything. But, uh, but it's so great to hear, you know, you put a lot of thought into this and, and everything. It definitely wasn't something you did haphazardly. Um, but it sounds like you put a lot of prayer and a lot of thought. And, uh, and there's, there's that, well, I think Orange talks a lot about it. Think about the end in mind. And, and yeah. it seems like, you know, that's, that's the end that you wanted in, in mind for your family, your kids, and, and the legacy that they're going to leave behind um, and the importance of connecting with other generations within your own family. No, oh, absolutely. I mean, the, it's the most important thing. And, you know, I, I guess I, I would I'd say two things for the, to the youth worker out there who's thinking, man, that takes a lot of guts to walk away from it and to embrace something else. There's nothing magical about it. It's sitting down with your spouse and having that tough conversation of what do we want for our lives long term. And I know maybe finances, like there's there's things that stand in the way of that. There's things that stood in the way for me and Britt. You know, it it, it didn't just happen overnight. Like there are things that we had to figure out of how we were going to do it. We didn't just decide one day impulsively and then I quit my job and we just moved. You know, it, we we may, we we were able to articulate clearly what we wanted for our lives. And then we came up with a strategy to achieve that. I mean, every youth worker in America does that. They just do it and they do it mostly really good at work. This is what I want for the ministry. This is where I want to take the students. This is how much I want to grow. This is how many more leaders I want to have. This is, you know, how, whatever the thing is. And then they come up with a strategy to accomplish those goals. It's the exact same thing. It's just applying it to family. So if a youth worker out there is like, man, I don't know if I could do that talk to your spouse about it, pray about it, like think about it because it's not impossible. And for the youth worker who is being sold the lie, which, you know what, this may sound terrible, you know, but it, the whole thing is true. There's, there's not all leaders, but there are some older leaders, seasoned leaders who will dangle the opportunity of a future in front of you like a carrot and will keep young leaders in bad situations. Mm-hmm. And they're not doing it maybe because they're mean or because they're vengeful or evil or they're doing it because they're leading an organization and they're making a calculated decision of how to keep their best young people that typically can work more hours with more flexibility at a lower rate of pay. How do we keep those people and usually dangling the carrot of opportunity and what could be and what the future might look like? Um, that's an attractive thing, but man, oh man, for, for that leader out there. And I mean, I'm thinking of someone, to be honest with you in my mind right now, um, a guy, you know, I used to work with who his family lives, you know, two, three States away. 
And, you know, there, and he's articulated to me, like, I, I just, I know that I have opportunity here, man. This is a place of opportunity. And it's like, bro, man, you're, you know, I hope that opportunity pans out because if it doesn't, you're going to look back with a lot of regret at all the memories you could have had with your aging parents, you know, that your kids could have had with their aging grandparents. And I hope it's all worth it because, you know, for me, it just wasn't worth it. It's what it wasn't worth it. And I walked away. And so for the person who's thinking, man, you don't know my church, there's opportunity. Yeah. Or, or giving goes down or your church explodes because there's a pastor issue and then, and no one, or they just start laying people off or they just decide one day to let you go because they want someone younger. Like it's the, the, the choosing of, and I'm not saying people quit ministry, but the choosing of an organization over family values, family goals. I mean, even Jesus made sure his mom was taken care of near the end of his life. You know, the, the family is so integral. Like it's just so, it's just so important. And sometimes we foolishly make big family decisions for what we hope will be the church future because people in ministry though, we can do ministry anywhere. Like, yeah, God, if, if, if we could only do it in some areas, then everyone would be called to do ministry in Fiji or Maui. The, the point is you can do ministry anywhere. And if you're thinking about the end in mind, you know, what gets you there? And if it's, you know, some people think, man, you know, I, so I want my career to, to go and, you know, I just want to keep growing my influence and this church is going to help me do it. Or they won't like, or they're just selling you that. And it's not really going to happen. Like, you know, I feel like my career is healthier now than it's ever been with a podcast that's going well, with a book coming out with my mentor and friend, Kurt Johnston, uh, you know, with, you know, other things on the horizon. Um, none of those things were happening when I was working at, at, at Mariners, not to the level they are now. Um, you, sometimes there's more to the path of your career than just the one straight line you believe will happen through where you're employed. Maybe God has something to do with it. He has a more of a, of a, of a wiggled, you know, windy road of your career planned than the straight line we tend to desire for, and usually want to create for ourselves. That's, that's great. That's a great reminder as well. Um, I'd like to jump back a little bit in time too, and, and hear about, uh, what was life like as, you know, you said your mom was really, you know, fighting for you guys as a family and everything like that. Did she, uh, help you, you know, understand, uh, Christ as a young age? Did you grow up in the church or was that kind of a later thing? Well, I, I, haven't really, I don't really talk about this that often. So this is, that's a really good question. Um, I actually grew up Jewish. I grew up Jewish okay. going to temple. I had a yarmulke with the Transformers puffy paint on it. And I was going, uh, and we went to temple our entire lives. I mean, as far back as I can remember, um, until my parents got divorced. And then we couldn't afford the membership fees at the synagogue we were going to. And and you know there just wasn't enough scholarship money. And so we stopped going to temple. And we, we didn't really do anything faith related at all. My mom was in a women's group, um, for a while. And one of the women in this group, her name is Nancy Morantis. She, uh, just, uh, this is just a totally secular women's group mm-hmm. was praying for my mom and for me for about a year without, you know, telling her obviously. And one day this woman, Nancy, um, invited her to go to church with her, a church called Wheatfield Christian Church. Uh, Missionary Alliance Church, which I think it's called Niagara Missionary Alliance now in Wheatfield, New York. And we went and I had to dress up, which I was, I did not want to do. But I remember sitting there in uh, a Sunday school class, I was probably eight years old. And um, the Sunday school teacher, her name's Nancy Byrne. She's still alive. She's awesome. They they live in New York, um, was talking about Jesus. First time I ever heard about this guy, Jesus, and was talking about him as a heavenly father. And I thought to myself, a heavenly father that loves me. Like my own father doesn't love me. Like Mm. there's a heavenly father that loves me, like sign me up. And I know that's completely not typical. Mm -hmm. Most people that have a difficult relationship with their dad have a very difficult relationship um, with God and understanding him as a heavenly father because their, their earthly father, their, you know, their, their biological father, the relationship is so tethered. But when I heard it, it just, it was just different for me. I heard this vision of a, of a heavenly father, this message of a heavenly father. And I was like, I'm into that. So afterward, so, and I prayed the prayer, to accept Jesus into my heart. And I raised my friggin' hand. I was eight years old. I raised my hand. <laughs> now you have to remember my father wasn't around. So I was a troublemaker at school. I was, I was picking fights. Some of them I was winning, some of them I was losing, but I was, I was just, you know, I was a kid that, you know, had no male influence, no direction. And so after high school is over my, I haven't told this story in so many years. 
after Sunday school was over, my Sunday school teacher, Ms. Burns, um, had me wait after class for my mom to pick me up. And when my mom came and picked me up, she was like looking at me. She was like, Oh, you know, I'd like to talk to you. And my mom was looking at me like these dagger eyes. She was thinking, what did you do? <laughs> what troubled you? I, we're here for the first time. My yeah. friend Nancy's here. You're about to embarrass I'm me. I'm never going to be able to come back here again. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And the Sunday school teacher said, Hey, you know, Justin uh, prayed to receive Jesus as his savior today, you know, kind of thing. And my mom was like, Oh, okay, great. Hmm. She had no idea what it meant. Like she yeah. didn't go to church. And I remember we were walking in the car and she's like, did you do that? Like, you know, to get attention or you, and I was like, no, I was like, you got to hear about this Jesus guy, like the heavenly father, like he cares mm-hmm. about us. Like, and I, I just remember it as clear as day. And it wasn't only until a couple weeks later that she also accepted Jesus. And, you know, two months, three months later, we were baptized, um, together. Um, she gave me a sterling silver cross that I still have, um, as a gift and we were really poor. So she scraped together a lot of money to give me this gift. And I still have that. And, um, and that church was the first opportunity I had to read scripture. Um, some of the men of that church were the first men to really validate me as a young leader, um, someone who is capable. And, uh, and it set me on a path of, I mean, I really heard my call of ministry at a young age at that church. And, um, and it was a big deal. It was a really big deal. Um, and that's the story. That's awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. And oh man, I haven't thought about that in so, a lot of those <laughs> details. I haven't thought about in so long. Yeah. Well, I'm sure, I mean, and whether you made a conscious decision, you know, to, to do that because of your experience or maybe kind of just kind of played a, a soft role in there, I'm sure, you know, the fact that you had that opportunity and were given that opportunity to learn about Christ at a young age, I'm, I'm assuming kind of played a little bit of a role in you following that path to ministry or, uh, or was there, were there kind of just other callings along the way that made it a bigger impact or like, how did, how did you know, I guess, that ministry was the path that God was, was planning out for you? All right. So I was going to church then from that point on for the, you know, for my, you know, I was, we were doing church and when I got into middle school, we started going to a new church. There was a, a, a looking back, I didn't really know what was going on, but now I know what was going on. The, you know, the pastor that was there, pastor Messer, who was great, um, was retiring. There was this church politicky battle over who was going to take over and the church split over it. Like I didn't know that at the time, but now looking back as a professional pastor, like I, I, could see, you know, I understand what was happening. And we started going to a different church closer by our house. And, and I was connected there through middle school. There's a church called Eastern Hills Wesleyan Church, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade was, was middle school there. Um, I think it still is. And I was there connected and it was during a really big you know, growth time in the church. So, um, we had a really cool student center off campus and the whole thing was great. Um, and uh, when I went to high school, I started going to a new church. I was one of the many kids that did not make the transition from junior high to high school, the church they were going to. I started going to a different church in high school. And um, at that church, I got even more opportunity, more opportunity to lead, more opportunity to speak. Uh, the pastor there at the time um, saw something in me and really fostered it and encouraged it. Um, but the when I was a sophomore, he, this pastor left to go to seminary. Um, and then things started coming out about really inappropriate sexual relationships mm. he was having with students, um, female students who were 18 years old at the time, but the students nonetheless, mm-hmm. and it was a gigantic deal. And I ended up walking away from church for about three years because mm. of it. Um, I remember the moment Satan whispered in my ear, if that guy couldn't do it, there's no way you can. And that line stuck with me for three years and I was drinking and partying and hooking up with girls and screwing around. Like I I was making every bad decision you could make other than drugs. I never did any drugs, but I had everything but drugs. Um, every bad decision you could make. Um, the, you know, and I, looking back, you know, I was, uh, you know, embarrassed by a lot of that. And it wasn't till I was, Oh man, in, uh, my freshman year of college that, uh, I went on a road trip with a buddy of mine. His name's Kevin Walker. Um, he was in my wedding. I was in his wedding and he was a student at Moody Bible Institute at the time. He invited me on a road trip from Buffalo to Iowa to visit his uh, girlfriend at the time, who's now his wife. And on that road trip, um, we, we talked about faith a little bit, but I didn't want to talk about that much because I wasn't walking with, with God. I knew enough to know that it wasn't for me and you know I didn't believe it or whatever. But when I was on this road trip, 
we were in Minnesota for a day on a boat and I remember sitting there and I left to like a pretty bad wake of disaster in Buffalo. I had a girlfriend that I had cheated on with a girl that I was working with and the word kind of spread and this girlfriend that I had showed up and my, my house told my mom all about it and she was pissed. Oh my gosh. She was so mad and she really laid into me big time. And, uh, and it, so I just left this big wake of destruction and I was sitting on this boat and I was playing through my head, this movie of my my life, the way I was running it, you know, out for my own goals, trying to figure it out myself and where that would eventually take me. And then there was this movie playing of what my life would look like if I really trusted in God again and gave him control. And it was in that moment on that boat, there wasn't a speaker, there wasn't a camp, it wasn't a big event. It was in that, on that boat with three, you know, four other people, only one of which I still talk to, well, I guess two, cause he married one of the girls. Um, I said, I need to give my life back over to Jesus. I need to make some changes. And I roll, and I mean, I rolled over to my buddy and I was like, Kevin, I was like, I, re- I think I need to, I need to put my life back in the hands of Jesus. I I think I'm I'm throwing my life away. And it totally caught him off guard. And when I came back from that road trip, I came back a completely different person. I came back with a a humble heart of apology for that girl that I cheated on. I came back with a humble heart of, you know, the sin that I was doing wasn't good. And I didn't have all the language for it, but I had the language for, I shouldn't have I shouldn't have cheated on my girlfriend with you. I'm sorry that I did that and, you know, did that to you and did that to her. And people look at me with a confusing, like, what did you do? Like we were having a good time and like, well, a good time, you know, it's good for a moment, but you know, I regret it. And I wish I didn't do that. And, you know, friends who were like, Oh, Justin's back. Like, let's go get hammered. Let's go get some chicks. And I was like, no, you know what? I actually want to go to church tomorrow. You guys want to join me? And I lost like half of my friends, like yeah. in this, in the snap of a thing, in snap of my fingers, I lost half my friends. And the, but the, I mean, I haven't looked back since it was, I started getting involved. I was started getting involved in the church called the chapel at cross point. They had a thriving college ministry, which they still do. A guy named Wes Aram runs it. And he was my college pastor for many years. I mean, for the you know few years before I left for college and I was telling him, man, I'm miserable studying business. Um, you know, what do you think I should do? And he asked if I was serving in the church. And I said, no, he's like, you should start serving. And I started serving with the high school ministry, um, under a guy named David Miller, who's a, who's now a lead pastor to church in Florida. Um, I started serving under him and, uh, and it was awesome. And I was doing high school ministry and it was a blast. And through that, I really felt that calling to ministry rekindled, reaffirmed again. Mm -hmm. And so I started asking the question of where am I going to go to college? I'm poor. You know, we were still poor. Mm -hmm. Um, Where am I going to go? And I had the opportunity to go to a college called Central Christian College of the Bible in Moberly, Missouri. It's an incredibly awesome college. And I went there. I was there for four years, got my degree in youth ministry, um, and you know, then obviously, you know, the, went to California and, and everything from there. But uh, but that's kind of how the that calling got rekindled after a, a very long, you know, three years. You're really doing my own thing. Yeah, yeah, that's so cool. Just to like, you know, God didn't give up on you. <laughs> Clearly, um, just yeah. kind of kept. You know, he had he had bigger plans, and that's that's yeah. awesome to hear. So I know you're kind of in the middle of transition and stuff like that. But uh, kind of talk a little bit about what your what your ministry maybe looked like at uh, Mariners, and yeah, what sure. you know, you're still getting started there at San. San Sandals, is that what it's called? Sandals? Yeah. Sandals. So actually, yeah. the day that I'm recording this, this is actually my very last day on okay. staff at Mariners. Um, there isn't much to do on your very last day somewhere. Right. So uh, so we're recording this together. <laughs> and so today's actually my very last day. So I don't know when the episode's going to come out, but today's my very last day. And the ministry at Mariners is incredible. I, I spent six years working with a really talented team of, of professional youth workers, paid youth workers, and a team of incredible volunteers um, to build a ministry where every single student had a person who knew them and a place for them to belong. So through the band, through student leadership, through life groups, that you know we're growing every year through you know great leaders more leaders better leaders um we were able to build a really great junior high ministry um that uh that i think made a, a difference in the lives of hopefully a lot of families and a lot of students and i uh and i'm going to a church um monday is my first day there and i'll be it's a church called sandals church an incredible church um one of the largest churches in the country fastest growing churches in the country and i'll be overseeing junior high through high school across all the campuses 
And the, there's such a wealth, there's a whole thing I can say about this church. It's an incredible church, but the most incredible part of that church is it was my wife's home church when she was going to college. Um, she, is, she knows a lot of people there really well. She served there for many years. You know, she knows more people there than I do. Um, there's more people who are excited for her to come back than even know that I'm coming back or know who I am. They just know me as Brittany's husband, yeah. um, which is a very good place to be, a very healthy place to be. And, um, and so, but I'm really excited about it. I'm going to off the great stuff that the guy before me had done. His name is, his name's also Justin, by the way. Hmm. And, uh, I get to build off the great stuff he has done. Um, just like I got to build off the great stuff. The guy before me at Mariners did just like the guy after me at Mariners will build off what I've done. Um, and it, so there's good stuff, good stuff's happening. That's awesome. So, so a lot of times I like to ask Jewish people in, in ministry, you know, because there's tons of different ways to do student ministry. So what would your programming look like when you were, while you were at Mariners and, uh, kind of what did junior high ministry look like on a regular basis? Yeah, sure. So for us at Mariners, weekends was the, was the big show. I mean, it was everything. We wanted everyone to show up to the weekends. Um, big service, big box, it was the big show. Junior high, it was the big show. We wanted everyone to come to the front door of our church, which, ha- which happened every single weekend. Um, we followed a strategy called the transformational loop, which is um, the big weekends. And from big weekends, we get students signed up and into life groups. And from life groups, we serve. Um, and we believe that from from serving, if a student, you know, if they get it, they're serving, they're going to want their friends, the people in their circles of influence to experience the same thing. And they'll invite them to come and join us at a weekend. So, and we ran that strategy for six years. That's exactly what we did. Every weekend was a huge weekend. It was creative. It was fun. It's where new kids came for the very first time. And every weekend we would talk about life groups, not every weekend, but most every weekend talk about life groups, how great they are that you need to get into a life group. And from there, we got kids serving locally, got life groups serving locally. Um, we did some big ticket serve stuff to Mexico and we did one to Uganda that was absolutely incredible. Um, but the, but that was the strategy we ran a, a thrive parent ministry was a huge part of what we did at Mariners. Mm. Um, you know, weekly emails to parents to inform and equip them coffee with the junior high pastor, um, so that we were available to them, um, and parent nights so that they could come and get some training, some learning on topics that were relevant to them as parents. And we did that over and over again for six years. Nice. Nice. So like you said, you're just getting started at your new church. Do you have any yeah. uh, any any ideas in mind? You're going to be like, what things will look like? Can I go into that? And you're stepping into high school and middle school, so you haven't yeah. haven't done that for a while. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll probably, I'll say a couple quick things to that. Um, you know, one, I, I've spent zero time there. I, you know, I know some of the people. We've had some you know conversations here and there, but as of this moment, I mean, I haven't stepped foot in there as a you know the paid staff guy yet. So uh, you know, to come in with too many preconceived notions is, is wildly unhealthy. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't have any other than what I know has been communicated to me. And a couple of those things are across all the campuses. We want to have a standardized process for how we do what we do at the campuses, what we teach, how we do parent ministry, how we do small groups, the curriculum we use, how we do events, how we do promo. Like we don't want campuses all doing their own thing. We want to have a standardized system for how we do it and for how we launch campuses and and whatnot for, for, you know, junior high, high school ministry. So I'll put a lot of time into that. Um, they, you know, I'll, I'll be big part of the calendaring process. So, you know, they do their calendar, their ministry year from January to December. So I'll, I'll be jumping in with that. They start the planning for that in August. Um, and in parent ministry is also one of the things that they have already communicated. They, they want to make, you know, take big steps in parent ministry, how they connect with parents and, um, and, you know, and we've done that at Mariners and, and I'm looking forward to doing it in, in the way that makes sense to, to the church I'm going to. But, um, but, you know, and there's a lot of other things that are on the list, you know, that, you, that I obviously want to take a look at and I'm, and I'm looking forward to getting to know more about, um, and hearing from the staff that's there. But, uh, but, you know, those are the things that have been communicated to me. Those are the things I'm going to put time into for sure when I get there. Um, And then more things will be added to that list as I get to know the culture of the church, get to know the youth workers that are there, get to know what their needs are, what they want to see. Um, You know, they've been there longer than me. You know, they're, you know, while I may come with some experience, they have more institutional knowledge than I have. Um, So it's really smart to, to maybe close my mouth and open my ears and really hear and learn what they've been doing and what's worked and what hasn't, what their vision is for their ministry and how I can help, you know, t- help them as young youth workers go to the next level. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the things I'm really excited about. So, um, that's what I would say. Awesome. 
Awesome. So I'm sure, you know, there's there's tons of wisdom that God has given you over the years in ministry, you know, from growing up um, in kind of a rough situation to, you know, run away a little bit from God for a little bit and, and having some different experiences in different churches, multi-site, um, big churches, small churches, all those sort of things. So what are a couple tips that you would like to share with our podcast audience today that uh, you, you've learned over the years, maybe even if you could kind of you know, if you were to put yourself in a mindset of, you know, what would what would Justin of, of 10 years ago in ministry would have benefited knowing what you know now today? Oh, man. <laughs> so so I'm 33 when I was 23. Here's a couple of things that I would I'd want to. Here's a couple of things. So with that mindset, these are a couple of things I would say. Um, I would have wanted to create much better um, health in my daily practices um, than I did over those the last 10 years. You know, the, and I'm talking about health, not balance. So mm-hmm. I, I want health as a single person so that at, when I get married, I have health as a married person. Um, I want those things. And I didn't create that as a single person. I worked, 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 worked. And when I got married, I thought I'd just work, work, work more, and but then just be able to have sex a, a lot too. <laughs> and it, you know, it turns out marriage isn't like that, that there's actually a lot more to marriage than that. Right. So I had to, and luckily my wife is amazing and very different than me in all the right ways um, and very gracious and understanding. Um, I had to make changes to my rhythms to become more healthy because being a single youth worker is different from being a married youth worker. And I had to make changes to be a healthy married youth worker, not an unhealthy, you know, single youth worker. So I had to make changes and, and luckily she walked that road with me in a big way. Um, but that, that's a huge thing. I think that's a gigantic thing, creating better rhythms of health um, in my early years. I wish I would have done that um, differently. Um, I'd probably say I, I wish I would have taken time to hone my skill at the professional side of ministry, not just the youth ministry side of, of youth ministry. Mm-hmm. So when I say professional side, you know, I didn't learn in college a lot about budgets and, and spreadsheets and how to organize spending. You know, I didn't spend a lot of time learning about um, what a business manager does at a church and how to partner with them, you know, successfully. Um, the I didn't learn the professional side, uh, the, you know, operational or administrative, the, uh, I don't want to say adult side, but it's the side that doesn't include dodgeballs and slip and slides. Right. Like it's the stuff that the, that the business managers, executive pastors, the stuff that they put their time into. Um, I didn't hone those gifts early enough. I wish I would have put more time into that. Um, I'd probably say third, I think that the key to great leadership is self-leadership. You know, the you know, great leaders are really good self-leaders. Um, you, you know, they lead themselves. They know what they how to develop, you know, what they need for development. They know um, what they need for, um, you know, for a healthy future. You know, the, a part of a self-aware leader brings in other voices. Um, a self-aware leader seeks out older mentors that can help them and coach them um, and disciple them and discipline them when needed. Um, I, I didn't embrace a self-awareness enough enough at a young age. Um, I wish I would have done that. Um, and self-management, like I, I didn't take management of my own time, um, as valuable to my leadership as I should have. I, I would make changes to that. Um, I'd probably speak words to myself about competition that Mm. you don't need the biggest ministry. You Mm. don't need to have, you know, the most attention, the amount of your budget does not reflect your value. The amount of your salary does not, you know, reflect your value. Um, the amount uh, of kids in your ministry does not reflect your value. You know, you don't need to run down other ministries in order to build your ministry up. Um, you know, these are the things I would have said, cause I made a lot of mistakes. Mm. Um, you know, your success isn't what you do. God cares more about who you're becoming than what you're doing. Now, that doesn't mean you don't do. Like, I'm a doer. I like doing things. But if at the end of the day, I feel my value is defined by what I've done more than who I am or who God's made me to be, then I'm, I, then my mindset's completely off and my identity is completely off. You know, if, 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 if I'm no longer a youth pastor, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm, you know, I'm God's son. I mean, he loves me. So if you don't have that mindset, then you're going to have a very difficult career. If you feel you need to constantly compare and compete with other ministries and whatnot. Um, uh, and so those are the things looking back, I'd probably say things for the present, you know, some of these are really, really simple. 
I really believe that every problem can be solved with more and better leaders. I think if you, <laughs> not just more leaders, more warm bodies, not just better leaders of taking a few leaders and really training them really well, I think more and better leaders, any problem can be solved with more and better leaders. So if we're constantly looking for leaders, constantly training them, constantly recruiting, um, constantly casting vision, that's a really good thing. Um, I think that next to the Bible, the business card is the best ministry tool we have. When we're able to take our business card out and hand it to a parent or hand it to a potential volunteer, Let's have a meal. Let's talk more about what it could look like to have you involved. I want to hear more about that problem. Email me. Let's get together. You know, I I, I want to know our parents. I'd love to come over for dinner. Get to know our families. Here's my card. Email me. You know the um you know the, for a student. You know that is lame. You'd never hand a business card to a student. Yeah. You know, but for a parent, most parents who understand the business networking world, um, they understand the power of a business card to initiate relationship. That that's that's being a youth worker who can speak the parent language well. And so I'd I'd probably say make sure you always have business cards in your pocket. Um, I'd probably say to junior high youth workers specifically that what you do is really valuable. And your job is to be a great steward of the years you have with them to build off what they did in kids ministry, not to run it down as, you know, child stuff, but to build off what they've done. Um, and your job is to set the high school guy up or high school girl up for a great measure of success that you get kids excited about moving to what's next. You know, a, a, a bad a big junior high ministry that builds a bunch of kids that want to stay in junior high uh, is not a healthy junior high ministry. You know, I don't want to build um, an empire in junior high. I want to grow disciples and then move them to what's next, hoping that the high school person builds off what you've done in junior high. And, uh, and I probably say the really last thing is, you know, ministry is, is really just a bunch of talents that God gives you for a season. You know, the, you know, I would, I would regret, you know, being the youth worker that plays it safe and cautious all the time. And though, cause I think they're going to, they're going to be greeted with hostility with how they manage the talents of what God's given them. But I really believe that uh, if you as a youth worker believe that it's your ministry, they're your kids, you know, this is you, um, that you're setting yourself up for failure because there's going to come a day where God asks you to, to return the talents of responsibility of that ministry to him. And because it's not yours to own. It's his. We're just managers of it. And let's be passionate managers. Let's be dialed in managers. Let's be, you know, let's be, you know, excited and passionate and bought in. And, you know, let's be hands-on managers of what God's given us. But know that the day's going to come where God's going to say, your time is, is done. It's time for someone else. I need you to give me back the talents of this ministry. And we have to be willing to say, okay, God, it's yours. Here you go. And be ready to move on to what's next. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but uh, it's, it's a real thing. And I, I think we don't talk about it enough that these ministries are not, you know, lifelong, you know, assignments. It's, it's a season. It's, it's talents. Let's do the most with it that we can while we have it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that was, uh, that was something that I realized when, when God moved me last year, um, it's from, from New Hampshire to Colorado was, you know, I, I thought I was going to be on this forever and, and everything. And all of a sudden, like just life transformed just overnight, I felt like, and uh, I was like, wow, okay, this, this thing that I thought was mine is, is not mine. I was just this huge reminder, um, to me that, uh, that is not the case. And, and God has continued to do awesome things in my previous ministry, um, because it really is his ministry. I was just, uh, entrusted with it for a little while. And, uh, now he's got other leaders that are, that are entrusted and he's entrusted with, and, uh, they do awesome. And, uh, and it's really cool to just see that that's still doing well. And now I'm involved in this one and, you know, who knows how long I'll be here, but, uh, but for the while, you know, it's, it's something I'm going to take very seriously, but at the same time, knowing it's, it's always God's. So that's some great, yeah. great, great wisdom that you've shared today. Um, I am sure that people are going to want to hear more from you. So um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your podcast and uh, sure. this book deal and, and uh, yeah. let people know how else to connect with you. 
Sure. The we have a we I run a podcast called the Controlled Chaos Podcast. It's a junior high ministry podcast for youth workers. Although other people who don't do junior high ministry listen to it, um, and it's just a lot of fun. We talk about junior high stuff. We talk about Generation Z. We talk about you know we go through different topics. I do a lot of it with Kurt Johnston, and uh, and it, which is a ton of fun. I mean, just the guy knows what he's talking about, and getting to do it with him has just been a total blessing. And we're we we took his book Controlled Chaos, which was written in two thousand three. Um, it was the best-selling junior high ministry book of all time. And we we expanded it and made some revisions to it and included some other voices. And it's coming out in uh, October um, with the youth cartel. They're publishing it. And it's going to be an incredible book. Uh, it's called Controlled Chaos. It's all about junior high ministry. And um, and you should, people should be looking for it. It's going uh, to be a really, really good book. And you can connect online. And, um, you know, if anyone ever wants to, you know, text me, you just text me. My cell phone number is 714. 714- 600 354 and uh, I love talking to youth workers so just let me know and and just text me don't call me I never I'm bad at phone calls but I'm amazing at text messages and if you ever have any questions or want to talk more we can set up a time and we can do it that's awesome so man Justin thanks so much for your ministry and and for taking some time today to to be on our podcast and uh and yeah God bless your ministry your your podcast your book deal like all that stuff uh, your transition here man I, you got a lot of things going on but uh but i know god's gonna continue to bless it and uh can't wait to see what you do next thanks so much man i love the podcast keep doing what you're doing you're great thanks I hope you really enjoyed that conversation with Justin Herman. Justin is up to great things with his own podcast and with his book deal, uh, with, uh, with Kurt Johnston there. And, uh, I just, I, I'm just really interested to see what God does next in this next stage of his life. So make sure you do keep, keep up tabs, uh, with, with Justin as this whole transition goes and make sure you follow him on social media and get in hold of him and, uh, just keep asking him some questions because I know God is continuing to teach him some stuff. And uh, maybe you have some questions about, you know, how to choose how to choose your own family above ministry, and how what that really looks like, and I mean, maybe something Justin talked about today would kind of just spark something in your own mind. Make sure you reach out to him. And also, we want to thank our sponsors again: WorkCamp NE at w o r k c a m p n e dot com. Make sure you check out their website, and also check out the National Network of Youth Ministries website at youthworkers dot net and reach youth New England at reachyouthne.com. All those organizations are awesome for sponsoring this. Thank you so much to them. And uh, also thank you for for checking out this episode of the Student Ministry Podcast. Thank you for your subscriptions. Thank you for your positive comments. Thank you for sharing it with other youth workers. And thank you for just continuing to to listen to these amazing stories that we get this the opportunity to to hear and and to, and to just engage with every episode so that's all for today um, make sure you do continue to subscribe and share and we'll see you on the next episode of the student ministry podcast and may god bless your ministry